All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bible Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. I'm here to read today's intro and to today's message. All right. <laughs> we are excited to welcome you to another enriching study of God's Word with Bible Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Pastor Scott will be delivering a powerful message titled, We Are Not Going Back. All letters caps. <laughs> This lesson is designed to inspire and equip believers to stand firm against the temptations to return to their old ways. The question we must ask ourselves is this, have we journeyed so far in our walk with God that we have lost any desire to turn back? In these times, the spirit of apostasy is widespread, but the Bible reassures us that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. God is faithful to keep us if we truly desire to be kept. The challenge, the challenge many believers face is that while they may have physically left the world and its ways, their hearts may, may not be fully free. We must confront the, uh, the question, why are we still tempted by these things we know are harmful if we have truly forsaken our old life? Pastor Scott will address these critical issues, offering guidance on how to deal with temptation at our weakest points by the end of today's lesson, we shall all be thoroughly equipped uh, to resist temptation and to make the proclamation that we are not going back. Turn over to you, Pastor Scott. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Emmanuel. Thank each and every one of you for coming out today. Uh, those that have, uh, I think Minister Dion did his actual opening prayer. Sister Shay did the welcome. And then uh, Minister Emmanuel uh, came in. We had Sister Tanya did the testimonies. And uh, I'm sorry I got a chance to miss some of the testimonies. But again, um, I do know God is still moving and he's still good. And so uh, don't make it look like there's only certain people being blessed. Share your testimony. Send them in to Sister Tanya. And uh, like I said, if you don't even want your name to be on it, just let us know what God has done for you. And then that'll be a wonderful thing. So I do, uh, like I said, I want to go into this lesson now. Uh, I do want to thank, I have uh, Sister Laura Lai that's here and Ethan. And I uh, want to thank God for my dear friends, to Catherine and just uh, Elder Bear. We're praying for her. And uh, just each and every one of you that are here, Brother Philip, so good to see you. Uh, God has something uh, wonderful for us today. And as Minister Emmanuel gave you the title, the title is, We Are Not Going Back. That, that is something that a lot of us have faced in our life. And just think about it. When you hear someone say, it, we're not going back, what does that mean to you? Uh, Sister Tanya, what does it mean to you? Somebody said, we're not going back. Um, I think it means, you know, when you're referring to it like that, um, you're not going back to something that you once did before. So you obviously experienced something before and now you're in a different place and you don't want to go back to that place because most likely it wasn't a good place you've learned and you've grown from that place. Very good. Excellent. Just think about it. Why would a person want to go back to something that didn't work then? That's a question. Now, Sister Shay, why would a person want to go back to something that didn't work before? Um, because it's comfortable or you or they're used to it. I mean, in my opinion, I, yeah, I mean, it's just comfortable. I feel like even though it didn't work necessarily, maybe in some ways you saw some benefit and then it went crashing down at some point. I don't know. Yeah. Well, believe it or not, that, that's, that's very true. There are a lot of people who know certain things aren't going to work out, but they're so used to being in chaos that that has become their norm. Uh, Minister Dion, what do you think I mean by it when I say it? they're so used to being in chaos that that's become their norm? Uh, when you say that uh, people allow, uh, paraphrasing, chaos to become their norm, you know, when people are so like in destructive environments every day, you know, like there's certain bad areas in the United States where there's gang violence and stuff. Those people grow up in those areas and in that mindset of, you know, kill or be killed every day. So they don't even know any better, you know, what peace truly feels like. So it's just like they these people in chaotic places don't really understand what peace is or happiness is. Mm -hmm. That's very good. 
let me ask this question then, because we, we, I mean, you all, everybody's talking really good, so I'm just going to go with this flow too. So then, um, Elder Brian Barrett, when people get comfortable with chaos, what can we tell about their faith when they're comfortable with chaos? What can you tell about a person's faith when you're comfortable being in chaos? Their faith can be very small. Um, you just more than likely will go back to what you know. And this new thing is such a new thing that you really don't actually believe it works because right. you haven't experienced it and you know all the other stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, in most cases, it can be really, really uh, short-lived. Yeah, very good. You know, just think about it like this. Sometimes people say, you know, a little bit of something is better than a whole lot of nothing. That's not necessarily true. Because if that little bit of something is something that's hurting you, you got to just be able to say, you know what? I got to let this go. Minister Emmanuel, why do you think it's so hard for people to let go of their past? Well, primarily because, you know, we wouldn't give it over to God. And uh, we'll hold on to that memory. Like I remember one thing that you said when Jesus died, he didn't desire, he didn't die for the feeling or the memory of sin. And so we'll hold on to those memories or even the devil might bring certain feelings back to cause us to go back and, uh, you know, draw us in closer to him. Very good. Some of us live in what's called a clandestine affair. It's an affair that we have or an affection we have for the world because some things were fun. The Bible says that sin is fun for a season. So there are some things that from our past that were sinful, that were ungodly, that we liked and we didn't want to give it up. If you ever realize, think about it like this. There are certain things, well, let me just ask a little question here. So I gotta, I gotta ask. So Tanya, you, you, you've been uh, batting a thousand lately. So, hey, let me go uh, uh, get you up here to hit a home run. When people know that they had things that were fun in their past and they can't get there, you can't go back in your past, what do they do to reminisce that fun that they had for their past? They talk about it. <clears throat> they talk about how, you know, the good times that they had or different situations and what happened. And, you know, even if it's something bad or dangerous, they'll still talk about it like it's funny or fun. Mm-hmm. Very good. Don't you know that the devil loves to remind us of the fun times we had in our past? He doesn't want you to know. He doesn't want you to think about all the failures and everything. It could be even a relationship that you had in the past. And they'll be like, hey, you remember so-and-so? And y'all -so? went to this place and it was just so fun. And you guys were like, had stars in your eyes and things were great. But he won't mention that was the same person that lied on you. That was the same person that took advantage of you. That was the same person that used you even in front of your friends and embarrassed you. He won't, the devil will never tell you about his wrongs. Well, let, me, let, me, let me paint this picture a little more clear. The devil always uses virtuous colors to paint the picture of sin. He always used virtuous colors to paint the picture of sin. He knew that if he drew sin the way it really is because the bible says that sin leads to death i tell you what let's make it even easier we're going to get ready to go into this lesson and you'll see in this actual episode that we'll be reading about what takes place with uh three care well two characters that have really big significance in this story here you'll find me coming from the book of genesis the actual 19th chapter the book of genesis verses i mean chapter 19 <coughs> excuse me I'm going to read one verse today. I know somebody say, hey, one verse, okay. All right. Genesis, the 19th chapter, verse number 17. And here we go. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, and, and he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plains. Escape to the mountains, least thou be consumed. So let me kind of, since I don't have as much time because I got here a little bit late uh, for my other service, 
Let me kind of give you what's going on at this point here. This is a story about a gentleman whose name was Abraham. And we do know the story of Abraham, how God had called him uh, in Genesis, the 12th chapter, from a place called Ur of the Chaldeans. And God told him, I'm going to take you to a place that's flowing with milk and honey, and I'm going to show you exactly where it's at. So Abraham gathered his wife. He gathered his actual his belongings, but he took his nephew, and his nephew's name was Lot. Let me just give you a side note before we even get into the story real good. You know, I used to say to people when I was thinking about this story here, don't take a lot with you. It's a double, you know, a double idiot type. Yeah, he's Lot. The man's name is Lot. But Abraham should not have taken Lot with him. Sometimes we take things with us that God never wanted us to take. And let me give you a first uh, thought of a side note. Here it goes here. Whatever that is that God have delivered you from, don't go back. You have to be a person that makes up your mind. We're not going back. And sometimes you have to speak this thing to yourself, speak it to your mind, speak it to your body, speak it to your spirit, and that we're not going back. Because even the Bible says, he that taketh hold to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom. It's very important that we realize God wants us to live a progressive life and go forward. If you keep on looking backwards, uh, Sister Shay, what do you think will happen if you're trying to walk down the street and you keep on looking backwards the whole time, what do you think is going to happen to you? You're going to run into something eventually. You're going to run into something eventually. That's why it's not good to uh, continue to talk about your past and all your problems and everything that you were going through and what the devil did this and this happened here. Because eventually, if you keep looking back, you're not going to see what's before you. I've seen many times people get in these car crashes because they have distractions they allow to happen in your, their life. And if we don't watch it, we can very easily get distracted. And the very thing God is wanting us to do, we'll miss out on it because we're let other things get in the way. So in this story here, uh, we talked about, we're talking about Abraham. So Abraham was without child. And we know that God came to Abraham and told him and told his wife, Sarah, he was going to bless them with a child. Now, Abraham, he's at 90 years old when God tells him this, this, this promise. Sarah is 10 years younger than him. And she's like, okay, all right. So what winds up happening they go down to the, the what was called the promised land, and there was a famine there. How many times have you had in your life you were looking for God to move and God to work something out, and it's seemingly the very thing you were looking for God to work out did not work out? How did that make you feel? Elder uh, Brian Barrett, how did it make you feel? You've been believing and trusting God for something, and you've been praying and it seemed like after you prayed and everything, you go to see if God moved, and he, he did not move. How does it make you feel? It makes you feel bad. It makes you feel that, um, well, one thing, you, you learn that God's not a genie. You just can't rub, rub something and things show up. But before you get to that point, you're disappointed and you're upset. Amen. It's okay to be upset. It's okay. Now, when I say be upset, I'm not saying you try to take that anger out on God. That's dangerous. But it's okay to be upset and you desire certain things to work out. But I want you to know, because uh, as Minister Emanuel uh, said in the actual opening and the uh, introduction, and I really do thank him for reading that, it is important that we realize how to deal with temptation. When things don't work out our way, it is a temptation many times to give up on God. And when people get ready to give up on God, they have to blame something or somebody. And generally what happens is people will penalize God for what other people have done to them. Sister Tanya, what do you think I mean? People will penalize God for what other people have done to them. 
Yeah, you hear that a lot. You hear people say, you know, like, why would God do this? Why would God, you know, mm -hmm. let this happen? You know, but they don't actually look at we have our own will and people are going to be people. So <laughs> they just blame God. Yes. It's it's the easiest thing for them to do, I guess. They don't want to wow. blame other people. All right. You, 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 hey, you're still bad in a thousand, lady. Hold on. Keep the bad up. You're doing it. Yes. It's easy for people to blame others. And indirectly, they blame God because you represent God. You should know that many times people are not going to see God physically unless they see God in you or they see God in me. It is imperative that we make sure that we're trying to live the best example we can, but don't blame God or don't blame the creator for the creation's faults. I'll say that again. Don't blame the creator for the creation's faults. See, God is perfect. God doesn't make mistakes. We do. But just because a person makes a mistake and they may be representing God, that should not be your segue to leave God. Because God will never give us a reason to leave him. If God, if we are praying for something and that thing that we're praying for does not come to pass, I want you to know why it didn't come to pass. And today you're hearing it come from Pastor Scott himself. The reason it didn't come to pass is because it was not God's will for it to be in your life yet. It was not God's will to be in your life yet. Because if there's something that God wants to be in your life, there's nobody, as the Bible says, there's no good thing that he will withhold from them that walk upright. If you are serving God and you're walking upright and you're trying to do your due diligence to please God, I want you to know God will go far and over the river and through the woods for you to see that you're blessed. Most parents, most parents just want to know, hey, Sister Shay, you there. Uh, what do you think? How would you get things that you wanted your mom to do for you when you were a young little girl? How could, what would you do? Uh, for your mom because you really wanted her to do something for you, what type of thing would you do to kind of like, you know, kind of, you know, make her soft and want to do great things for you? Um, Honestly, I feel like I just would ask her. I, mm -hmm. I'm a beggar. I still am. How would you ask? So, <laughs> I'm very, I guess, nicely or I'd sometimes offer if I could do something for her. Um, oh, I don't know. Trying to say you trying to sound real, real intelligent. I don't know. How, how did you really sound? How would you say it to your mom? Um. Okay, no, I'm going to help you I out. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you out. Sister Tanya, tell how Shay would say certain things when she wanted you to do so. This is her mother, for you all that don't know. This is her mother, and her mother's going to tell the whole truth. How would she say things? Uh, Mom, 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 mom. Mom, hey, mom, mom. <laughs> she is correct in saying that she was a a beggar. She wore me down. Like she wouldn't stop till she got what she wanted. And a wow. lot of times that's exactly what happened. I was like, fine, whatever, fine, just go do it. <laughs> wow. Let me tell you, see there, that both that, that's another thousand. Listen, that's what God wants us to do to him. He wants us to be praying. And if he doesn't move yet, keep on praying. God sometimes is very negotiable. So watch this. Abraham, he's out here with Lot. He goes to the actual promised land, Canaan land, and there's a famine. So what does he do? He goes to Egypt. Egypt being right next to Israel. Canaan and Israel, same place. He goes over there and finds out that the Pharaoh took a liking to his wife. And he was like, if I tell Pharaoh that she's my wife. He's going to try to kill me and take my wife. So he told Sarah, tell them that I'm your brother. Don't tell them I'm your husband. Tell them I'm your brother. Well, sometimes we get ourselves in situations and make it worse by lying. So what happens is because God still loved them and had work for them, he intervened and he gave Pharaoh a dream and showed Pharaoh that this man was not her brother, that is her husband, and God is with them. And then, not only that, he told the Pharaoh, God told the Pharaoh to give them anything they wanted. 
So the Bible says in the 13th chapter, verse 1 and 2 of Genesis, when Abraham was let go out of Egypt, he was let go very rich. And if the Bible says you're very rich, you were very rich. You really were. So let me give you some scenarios that lead up to this verse that I started with in chapter 19. So in uh, 13, the chapter 13, verses 7 uh, through 12, what happens is there's an individual which is named Lot. That is Abraham's nephew. Lot leaves Egypt with them, and he was given blessings also. Sometimes God will bless you by who you're around. Uh, Elder uh, Brian Barry, what do you think I mean? God sometimes will bless you because of the people that you're around. You're going to be blessed. Well, if they're blessed by God, you being around them, you also can be blessed by God. Yeah. That's why I try not to hang around people, people that are like crazy and they don't love God and they don't, do, I don't try to hang around crazy people. No. Mm -mm. Nope. The reason I don't is not that I'm not trying to witness. Now, I'll witness to anybody. I don't care if you got one foot, two foot, one ear, two, three eyes. It don't matter. I'll try to witness to anybody. But the thing is, I'm not trying to hang around people that aren't going to be beneficial to me. I'm not trying that. And let me just say this, too. Whatever you hang around the most, you become. I'll say that again. Whatever you hang around the most, you become. Don't believe me? Watch this. So what winds up happening is, here's the situation. Lot and his last men had arguments with Abraham's men. Because when they both came out of Egypt, they had a lot of men and a lot of uh, goods, silver, gold, other things. And Abraham tells Lot, hey, we don't need to have contention. We don't need to have a problem. Listen, uh, whichever way you want to take your men, go whichever you want. If you want to go north, south, east, or west, you go whichever way, and I'll go the opposite way. And the Bible says that Lot, he looked over all the plains, and he chose to go to a place called Sodom. Now, Sodom was next to another city called Gomorrah. The Bible says, though, Sodom was a wicked city full of sin ungodliness, unreverence for God. But that's the place that Lot chose to live. All right, watch this. I need somebody to do some more thinking. A ministry manual. Why would a godly person, out of all the places he could have picked to go, why would he pick the worst place and have the most sin at that place? Why would a person pick that? Uh, the flesh is weak. <laughs> flesh is weak but the spirit is uh willing and and he just leaned on his flesh and wanted to uh get closer to his uh internal desires honestly mm -hmm. very good excellent and then minister Dion, to go along with that why do you think uh lot allowed his men to get in this argument with abraham's men i'll say because he kind of wanted it to happen so it didn't look like it was really on him. It was just an easier choice to make. Like, All right, you go your way. I'll go my way. Uh, yeah. Let me tell you something. Not every argument is dealing with the situation that's at hand. Some people establish arguments with other people in order to go somewhere they've been wanting to go anyway. And so if somebody asks them, where are you going? They'll just say, well, I'm going out because I'm mad. But you know what? They've been thinking about where they wanted to go before, but they didn't know how to get there. You know, let me tell you this. You can't be happy and go and get in sin. You can't, I'm talking about you happy with God. You can't be pleased and happy with God and then go and fall into sin. No. In order to get to sin, especially if your environment is around a lot of people who love the Lord, you got to make an excuse. You got to get yourself out of the limelight. So that, you know, you just got to, you know, uh, hey, I, that's it. You, you just got on my last nerve. I'm getting ready to go. And then the person said, well, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Now they're stopping me from going where I wanted to go. No, you're not sorry. It's going to happen again. And I know it's going to happen again. So I'm going out of here. And, I, and you got to slam the door so they know how really mad you really, really are. Slam. Mm -hmm. dun, dun, dun. They call the phone. 
Don't, I told you, don't call me. I'm mad. Don't, no, don't call me anymore. I'm mad. All the time is to get them where they wanted to go. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I have had times in my younger years of the Lord. You have, to, you have to say that. In my younger years of the Lord, where there were things and places that I wanted to go, but I couldn't go not and be saved and not love the Lord. So I had to get mad. I had to allow somebody to get me upset. So then I could go to the boom, boom room. Minister Dion, hold on, hold on, let me talk. I got to talk to somebody who's been around a little while. Uh, Elder Brian Baird. Yeah, you ever heard of the boom, boom room? <laughs> and, and what do you think the boom, boom room is? No, I never heard of the boom boom room, but it doesn't sound good. It doesn't uh, sound good. Well, let, let, me give you music. let me give you something. Let me give you, I'm gonna give you three things that go along with the boom boom room. X, X, X. That's on the outside of the actual place called the boom boom room. Now, what do you think is there? Okay. <coughs> uh some illicit activities. Uh, listen, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. Illicit activities. Uh, we call that uh, strip clubs back in the day. <laughs> and you couldn't go, especially if you married, you better not be showing up at the boom, boom room. And you have to know a lot of people that sneak in the boom, boom room, uh, they have to wear their glasses. And then they have to kind of put your little jacket or throw your collar. Scott, how you know this? Huh? <laughs> Who, me? Uh, okay. Uh, I got a confession. I went and snuck to the boom boom room. This is years ago. I went and snuck and went to the boom boom room because I was upset with my wife. And I tried to pretend like, you know, well, this is when I was married too, so don't let anybody play no crazy thing. I've been, I've been, I've been without being married over 20 years. So thank you. So I go to the boom boom room and I forgot. I had been away from the boom, boom room so long. What really goes on there? So when I go into the boom, boom room, to me, it was like, man, I, this, 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 I like this place here. Uh, there's a girl over there. Her name is Chocolate. <laughs> and uh, I had to remember some of y'all have been knowing me over 20, 30 years. Yeah. So I knew all the girls. I knew all the what that what happens and everything, but now I'm new. I'm back new to it, so I get in there, and all the girls are there. And and, and Emmanuel, you probably never been to no uh uh boom boom trip club thing, but how do you think the music is playing up in there? Man. <laughs> the music, yo, uh, uh, very enticing, promiscuous, and you know. <laughs> Uh, and uh, a lot of bass. Yeah. You know, get the body moving. Get the body moving. You're right. right. Absolutely. Absolutely, buddy. You're, hey, I, I can imagine that too. Minister Dia, you, you'd you have to use your imagination. Wait, 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 wait back. You know, uh, you're going into the strip club. Uh, you know, how's the music and what, what, what are they doing there? Uh, they trying to dance to entice you and the music is trying to get you to go along to the rhythm you know of what's going on with them so that's it man I, when I went to the boom boom room I went in there straight Christian I went in there straight I love Jesus but I was just having a little problem with my wife you know so I go in there mm -hmm, yeah okay mm -hmm. and I start noticing as Emmanuel mentioned about that bass dum -ba -dum, dum -ba -dum, dum -ba -dum, dum -ba or let me uh, let me start, let me make it a little more clear I heard somebody say something. I think they were doing some construction in the place, and there was somebody was saying something about from the ceiling to the wall, and I can't even remember the other words. But yeah, uh, Skeet, Skeet, I mean, uh, somebody named Skeet was, I don't know, Frank Skeet, I don't know, Skeet, whatever. But they were, uh, and next thing I know, my neck dislocated. And I was, you know, the, Elder Brad, you probably never done this. You, you probably have already been like this. That night, I was. And they don't let me tell you this. If you're going to be in the presence of ungodliness, ungodly presence is going to make you move and sway with it. 
Nobody did. They was like, raise your hands in the air and raise it like you just don't care. I was like, like I don't care. Oh, no. Yeah. But while I was there, I messed around and made a mistake. Oh, man. I, I was saved too long. So while they're sitting there and the music is thumping, girls are dancing and everything, and they all look good, and they're like, whoa, and mom's like, wow. And they told me, they said, hey, you got to put money in there. Put money, you know, so they get some money. They're going to dance right here for you. What? Me going to get my money. I put a dollar up there. They looked at me like, that was your dance. One dollar? And I, oh, oh, my bad. I got the two, three dollars and everything. Now, I would only put a dollar in the church offering, but I'm putting three dollars and I ain't even seen the move yet. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and then they're dancing and then somebody rubbed up against me. I hollered out, praise the Lord. I want to say that one more time. In between the dancing, the, the women stripping and a whole full place in there, your boy hollers out. Praise the Lord with my $3. They stopped the music. Hey, God is my witness. I ain't going to even lie. They stopped the music. The woman who was dancing in front of me, Sister Tanya, she scooped down and she said, sir, you need to go to church. This ain't that. I looked, and my partner that was with me, because he brought me there, he was like, homeboy, what, what, man, you, you really said that. You we got to go, man. Let's go. Let's go, man. Let's go. And I was like, man, I didn't fit in no more to sin. So I decided that night, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. Mm -mm. Because I realized I didn't fit in. Watch this. So here is Lot. He's down in this place called Sodom and Gomorrah. And while he is there in Sodom and Gomorrah, they are doing, as Emmanuel said, Minister Emmanuel said, illicit things, ungodliness. I'm talking about, we're talking about people doing any and everything, every thought of the imagination. And while he's living there, the Bible says, and this was actually um, in the 18th uh, chapter of Genesis, uh, verses number um, eight, I mean, 20 through 21, that the angel of the Lord came with two other angels. And that angel actually was the Lord, God. And he says to uh, Abraham, I'm getting ready to go to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. I only felt it right that I let you know this. And the reason why he was telling him that, well, the reason why God was sharing, sharing with this with Abraham is because he wanted him to know that I'm keenly aware that your actual nephew is there. And if you want to, you want him to live, you're going to have to negotiate with me. Let me tell you something, saints of God. Sometimes people are riding on your prayers. Actually, many times. And a lot of people, they won't pray themselves, but they are hoping and praying or hoping and desiring that you're praying for them because they got more trust in your prayer. They got more trust in your relationship with God than their relationship with God. Like who in last last week's lesson, Minister Emmanuel, who had more trust in uh, one person than that other person? Oh, uh, that was um, um, Deborah. Yeah, Barack. Barack, yes. Barack. There was Deborah and Barack. God told Deborah to tell Barack to go down and fight these enemy. And Barack said, oh, I'll go, but I need you to go with me. He had to have a woman to escort him. I told you, ladies, God uses women too. And a lot of times the reason God is using a lot of women is because a lot of men are too frail and they're, uh, they're, too, uh, they're too into themselves to yield themselves to God. Sometimes people, especially men, men feel like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I'm bow down in another man. Listen, God will use whoever he want to use. And uh, because a lot of times people don't want to step up to a plate, God will say, you know what, I'll use somebody that's unlikely or uncanny that you don't think that I could use 
And that would be the person to deliver you back to the story. So here's Lot. He's down there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham's talking to this angel and talking to God. And then while he's talking to God, God says to uh, Abraham, uh, I'm getting ready to go and destroy him. Abraham says, well, wait, wait, wait a second, God. If there were 50 righteous people in that city, would you would you at least spare the whole city then? Because, you know, I mean, if there's 50 righteous, Abraham is now trying to negotiate with God because of the favor God has with him. Notice this. God didn't come to destroy Abraham. He's coming to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, you know what? If there were 50 people, I'll spare them. Abraham realized, uh-oh, God didn't move. He still looks like he's getting ready to go there. Well, well, well God, uh, if you don't mind, suppose, I mean, if there were 45 good people, 45 righteous people, would you spare them? God said, I would spare them. Even if there were 45, I would spare the entire city. Notice this. Abraham is not just interceding for Lot, his nephew, and his family. Abraham's interceding for other people. Don't ever fool yourself. I don't just pray for just myself or just people I just see right here. I'm praying for everybody I know. All of you all that are part of the Bible, I'm praying for. And I mention your name. God hears your name every, almost every day. Sister Lorelai, Sister Shiloh, Brother Eden, uh, 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 Sister um, Elder Angel Baird, uh, Sister Tanya, Sister uh, Shay, uh, Minister Dia. Listen, Brother Philip, all of you, I'm calling your name. Elder Brian Barrett, I'm calling your name. Minister May, I'm calling your name before the Lord every day. And I'm trying to be able to negotiate something where God will continue to just bless you with more. Because there are times that we do things that will sever our relationship with God. Abraham realizes he knew that Lot shouldn't have been there uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah from the start. Excuse me. He knew that he shouldn't even be there. Sometimes we know where people should not be. And then there are times when people, they just insist on getting around sin and being around sin. Some people like problems. I don't understand why, but some people like problems because it makes them feel like they, they, they have something in common with other people, especially sinners, because it allows them to gossip. It allows them to talk about problems. Listen, we all have to talk about problems sometimes, but you know what? Don't always bring your problems everywhere you go. Listen, cast your cares. The Bible says, cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. So what happens is, uh, Abraham begins to negotiate. He says, what about 40? God said, I'll spare the city if it's 40 people. He said, what about 30? He said, I'll spare the whole city if it's 30 righteous people. He said, what about 20? He said, I'll spare the whole city if there's 20. He said, what about 10? That's my last thing I'm going to say. God said, I will spare the entire city if, if it's just 10 righteous. Why do you think, Minister Dion, God would spare the whole city if there was at least 10 righteous people? I say because of the fact of how rampant sin was running there, that God was saying, you know, like there would still be a glimpse of hope if there was even 10, just because of how far gone that place was. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, the reason why he says that he'll spare the whole city if there's at least 10 righteous, because if you got 10 righteous people, God expects us to be sharing the gospel with people, to be inviting people out. These Bible screens right now and, and Bible, all of our screens should be filled up. But a lot of times people don't share the gospel. They won't share. They won't even invite people to come to Bible. They'll be like, oh, I got so blessed. Oh, I thank God, Pastor Scott. I thank God for the word. You're teaching everything. But why did you not even invite somebody? Because sometimes God is trying to see if you'll just invite someone and they can hear the word. Don't you know when you invite someone out, and they hear the word, and God touches them, touches their life, you get part of the blessing also? Yes. So then God starts headed towards Solomon Gomorrah. And here's Abraham. He has been praying and asking God all the way until he got to 10. So all he can do now is just, just pray that God will have mercy on his nephew. The Bible says that God goes over to Solomon Gomorrah, which is where I pick up my reading from the start. And while over there, 
at Sodom and Gomorrah, instead of God going, he sends these two angels. These two angels, when they get to Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot just happened to be outside of his house at the front of the gates, which come into the city. And as he came out there, as they, as he was out there, uh, he sees, he looks and sees these angels. He quickly knows that these are people that are not from the city. He, he quickly knows these are people of God. And he says to them, he begs these angels, come over to my house. And the angel said, no, we're here to destroy this city, but we're going to take an inventory tonight. We're going to look over the whole city. We're going to scour it and look over it. He said, well, no, 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 just please come over with us. Come over with me and have a meal. I'll go ahead and make a meal for you. Please come on over. And because he pressed on those angels, they came over to his house and he was having a meal with them. And then the Bible said, the men of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, which was, I told you, a very evil city, you should know also where there is sin, every deed and imagination of sins being done. So they, they were very much out there. Homosexuality was big. And when those men came into uh, Lot's house, soon after, there was a knock on his door. It's the men of the city and they want to go and have a relationship with these other two men. They don't know that these people are angels. Lot knows that they're angels because Lot has been around Abraham, which taught him the things of God. And guess what? You can be around people and they'll have no idea, no idea that it is God that is in the, in the presence. I've had people, I've been around people and they get to cussing and, and lying and cheating and everything like that. And I'm saying to myself, do I carry myself like that? I would entertain a conversation like that because I don't. And then when people find out, oh, he's not into this. Let me just give you another side note. People treat you the way they see you. I'll say that again. People treat you the way they see you. In other words, they're observing your actions. If you act ungodly, if you act like you, you don't have any coof about you, that's how people are going to treat you. They will. And when they're around you, they'll do any and everything that they would around somebody who's just from the street and just a thug or whatever. They don't care. The thing is, we have to come to that place where we realize, you know what? People are watching us. And if they're going to see Christ, like I said earlier, they're going to see it in me. So I got to make sure my walk is the best I can for the Lord. Watch this. So then what happens is that the men got so uh, desperate in their lust for these angels, they began beating the doors, almost beating the doors in. So here comes Lot outside and he says, brethren, don't, don't, don't do anything. Don't do anything to these men. You know, these are, these are my special guests and they're from God. Don't, don't do anything to them and everything. If you want, you can have my daughters. This is what this man said. If you want, y'all can have my daughters to do whatever you want to them. All right, brothers, sisters, I got to do a little side note here again. Uh, I, I know the, most of y'all that have daughters, you think like I do. Ain't no way in the world I'm going to offer my daughter or my son up for these people to do whatever they want. But here's the thing. When you've been around that type of environment of this ungodliness, you don't even realize that the residue of it, in other words, the ungodliness from other people begin to spill on you. I talk to people and they just start cussing and all these type of things. And I'll be like, hey, do you have to use that language? They don't even realize they're cussing. They're like, what, what do you mean? I see you're using that profanity. I really don't like all that, you know, around. Oh, I did? They are so used to being around that they become a part of it. Sometimes we can be so used to being around ungodliness and sinners and ungodly people that what happens is we start acting like they do. One time I was working at a um, at the store in Chicago years ago, and there were a lot there were a lot of homosexuals in the, in the actual store, and that worked there. Don't get me wrong; they were friends of mine, and. Uh, I was talking to another friend of mine and I had been there probably about three or four months. And they said, I know I had my hands on my hip. And I was like, what? You lying to me. And I caught myself. I was like, you lying to me. 
Ow! Oh! Straighten up, Riss. Straighten up. Listen. Who you are around and what you are around the most, you'll become. You got to watch. If you're not changing somebody, they're going to be changing you. There's no such thing as no compromising at all. I'm saying these are my best friends and I'm going to be straight. They're going to be straight. And then they'll do what they do. And I do what I do. Eventually something's going to rub off. And what I didn't even realize, a lot of that was rubbing off on me. And I was like, Ooh, boy, let me get myself together. Get myself together. The thing is, Lot became so morbid in his thinking that he offered up his own daughter. And then the angel said, uh-uh, Lot, come on inside. We're getting ready to leave. The angels tell Lot, do you have any other relatives besides your daughters? Now, his daughters, he had three daughters. I mean, two daughters. Those daughters of his were married. They went to try to tell the, the daughter's uh, husbands, come on with us. We're getting ready to leave. These angels are getting ready to destroy the city, and they would not leave. So the angels grabbed Lot by the hand because he was taking too long. Let me just say this. When God is getting ready to show judgment, don't play around. Get away from whatever that thing is that's harming or slowing you down or hurting you. Get away from that. There's certain things we need to let go right now. Stop lingering. Stop playing with it. Sin, the Bible says, sin bringeth forth death. You keep playing with the devil, he's going to cash in. And when he cashes in on sin, it'll be your to your own demise. He's trying to kill you. So the angels grab Lot by his hand. They grab his wife by the hand. And they grab the daughters by the hand. And they've taken them out of the city before they destroy it. God is giving Lot grace because of Abraham. Don't you know? We're given grace because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets them out of that city. And as they're going out of that city, uh, the angels say, now flee to the actual mountains. And Lot says, I don't want to, we don't want to go to the mountains. Send us to the city right next door. We don't have to be inside of Demora. Send us to this other place. It's called Zor. It's just a small city. Z-O-A-R, Zor. You can just send us there. And God said, there's nothing there. The word Zor means little and insignificant. Sometimes we want to hold on to insignificant things in our life, and God is saying, let it go. Stop lingering. Stop holding on to things that don't really matter. Don't wind up being a hill of beans, and it's going to lead to our demise. So then the angel says, the angel said, go over there to them then. This is the only thing I ask of you. When you go to Zor, just making sure, don't turn around. Don't turn around. Don't look back. And so Lot is leaving with his wife and two daughters. And as they're going, his wife decides to turn around. And the Bible says when she turned around and looked back at Sodom and Gomorrah, because God began sending fire upon it, she turned into a pillar of salt. There was two things that God sent on the actual city uh, cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. One was called fire and the other was called sulfur. Sulfur is like a very combustible substance. It is a, it is a uh, chemical that causes fire to spread even that fast, that much more faster. So he sent it over that on top of all of those that they were in Sodom and Gomorrah, and all of them were destroyed. And then when Lot left from Zor, he went to the mountains where the angels told him from the beginning because there was such a big fire and he wanted to be able to see what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible said his, his daughters decided, let's go ahead and get our father drunk because we lost our mother. We need to be able to have a relationship with him so his actual legacy can continue on. So they went and got their father drunk. And one night he had a relationship with one of his daughters. And then the next night they got him drunk also. And then he had a relationship with the other daughter. This is the 19th chapter of Genesis 33. And the Bible says that when he went and got drunk and had that sex with his daughters, they both got pregnant. And watch this. The first child they had named was Moab. The second child they had was called Abinadab. And those two children, it's called Abinadab something, I can't think of the exact name, but those two children 
became uh, two other nations. One was the actual Moabites that were the enemies of the children of God. And the other ones were the Amorites that were the other enemies of the children of God. But because he never trained his children up to respect their father and not have any incest with him, they began a new nation that was going to be the worst nations against them. And the fight that would be a fight that would last for centuries over the children of Israel, over the children of God. So I just want you to all to know this, and this is my conclusion. We're a few minutes over. My conclusion is this. Whatever God have delivered you from, stay delivered. And make up your mind of this one thing. We're not going back. Don't go back to it. Leave it alone. If it makes you feel like it makes you look weak, that's fine, but leave it alone. Amen. Without any further ado, we're going to ask uh, Elder Brian Barrett, he'll go ahead and close us with a word of prayer, and uh, then I'll I'll say the uh, the ending. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's bow our heads. Lord, we just thank you for our lesson today. And God, your grace is sufficient for us as we continue to help us to move forward and let the past be the past. Help us to stay the course. There's no turning back once we have put our hands on the plow. Help us to move forward each and every day, giving us the grace and giving us your uh, spirit that's within us, oh God, leading us and guiding us each step of the way. Lord, we just ask for these things that we will uh, uh, show ourselves approved by studying, by reading your word and doing the things, Lord God, that you said in your word that will keep us in our right minds and our right hearts until you return to get us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so very much for your prayer, uh, Elder Brian Barrett. Thank each and every one of you all for going, uh, I mean, for coming out. Uh, this actual message is being recorded. So uh, probably within an hour, you'll have a copy of this if you desire. I want to thank you. Take uh, time to thank you. Um, uh, my dear friend, Sister Catherine, uh, for coming out. Uh, thank uh, Sister Lorelai and Brother uh, Ethan, and also uh, uh, Elder Angel Bear, you're in our prayers. Uh, the Brother Philip. Uh, and a lot of times, the reason I'm acknowledging a lot of the people because they're not actually here in this area. And Brother Philip, like for instance, he's in Africa. So we do thank God for him. We thank God for each and every one of you all coming out. Go over this lesson. There's a lot to this. And uh, again, like we uh, have said more than a few times, whatever that is that God has delivered from, make up your mind and say, we're not going back. So without any further ado, have a wonderful day. Love you all. We'll see you next Sunday. And prayerfully, we're going to have a great message for you then also. Thank you, Ministry Emmanuel, for doing the intro also. God bless you all. We'll see you now. Bye-bye. We'll have a great day. Thank you, Brother Ethan.